Pharmaceutical Processing, in conjunction with Interfex 2016, presents Interfex Live. Okay, good morning, New York. All right, we're on third day here, Interfex Live. So today, being the last day, we got a couple of sessions where we've decided to change it up a little bit, and it'll be a one-on-one -on -one conversation more than a panel discussion. And um, we figured if that's the route we're going to take, we might as well take a walk down memory lane in certain cases. So as it turns out, in my real life, we've done a lot of tech transfer, and, uh, but who wants to listen to me? So we had a uh, good friend of mine. I guess we've been transferring products together. It's got to be over 30 years now. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about technology transfer. Uh, this is Chris Haas. Good morning. And um, we're going to start off and I think what we're going to look at is some of the challenges around tech transfer. I think one of the things that always kind of upsets me is that uh, tech transfer is sort of looked at as the uh, grand finale. It's like when all the non-combatants show up and you got to put up the bleacher seats for the last three batches. That's not, there's a lot more to it. Over the years it's changed. So these are the things that we're going to talk about. These are lessons that are shall we say, hard fought and painful. So um, I think most importantly, why don't, we take, why don't we start with the main challenges that we face in today's environment, tech transfer, Chris. What has been your experience? Uh, it's really the challenge for tech transfer is usually the timeline. Uh, there's tremendous pressure uh, to launch a product as quick as possible. And uh, my experience is that uh, more and more uh, people try to uh, overlook data and just try to push the submission forward to get the approval as quick as possible. Uh, I just experienced that uh, with a, a quite a few clients of mine uh, that they really ignored data. And the problem with that, when you ignore data, uh, it, it bites you sooner or later. Because if you don't correct the issues that you have during your tech transfer and validation uh, and you launch the product, the trouble is that it will get worse. So you better fix it before you get into uh, the validation. That, that, that's a big challenge that uh, marketing, corporate is pushing and really doesn't give you the material and the time to do a decent job. So yeah, obviously there's mistakes that are made. So what would you say are some of the biggest mistakes and the categories they fit into? Uh, the biggest mistakes? Uh, you mean with regard to overlooking data? Overlooking uh, data, overthinking it? Overlooking uh, performance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, when a tablet uh, laminates during your uh, scale up and tech transfer and you just say, yeah, it will go away eventually. Uh, you launch the product and, uh, you know, within six months uh, you get complaints and the FDA knocks on the door and says uh, you had 15 complaints in one month. They really don't care if you sold 7 million or 1 million tablets or more, 15 complaints or 15 complaints and you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So you better fix that kind of problems before you launch. Yeah, well, that goes back to the old adage. Problems, little problems just become big problems. I mean, there's no such thing as a minor issue. Uh, what about, I find that a lot of people overstaff. Sorry, can I ask a question about We're going to take questions at the end, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Yeah. Sound good? That's fine. Whatever. You got to remember, I got I to gotta stick with the script for a while. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so we're going to talk about now you threw me off. Where am I at? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to talk about is one of my pet peeves is the managerial approach. What I find essentially is they throw a lot of people at things where it essentially it's just mismanaged or worse yet. It's overstaffed, worse yet, and it's not the right people. So let's talk about the, 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 the mega teams for a minute. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I, just a quick example that I, I experienced uh, literally 10 days ago. And I, I was just amazed. And I'm not talking far, far away from here. Uh, it's actually in the more the Western universe, uh, where I was called in to mediate and help out 
for a tech transfer. And it was kind of a, a reverse tech transfer where uh, the company brought the product in from um, uh, contract manufacturing operations. And uh, it was a thermally sterilized uh, process. And uh, so they called me in and says, hey, can you help us out? Because uh, we tried three times to validate the process and we fa failed three times. I said, oh, the, that's interesting. Uh, so what exactly happened and how is the process designed uh, at your contract manufacturer? Then they said, oh, we are not allowed to talk to them. And they said, hey, excuse me? So they said, oh, no, only corporate can talk to the contract manufacturer, and then the corporate uh, gives us uh, the information. So you know there are at least two or three handovers, and you lose the information. So I think key is that you have a well-designed uh, team that sticks together and is responsible for uh, the tech transfers. So a uh, really key is you have a good project manager, and you also have a capable a colleagues from each category for the analytical message transfer, for the process, for regulatory aspects, raw materials, procurement. A, however, don't venture out into uh, these monster mega teams where 40, 50 people sit for five hours in one room and your portion is just five minutes. A, you really have to subdivide and have a core team that runs a, the project from a, a, let's say, strategic point of view, and then you have the tactical sub-teams that really do the legwork on the floor and a, in the lab. I think the other thing is you have to enable the people. Invariably, people think because they have a quality agreement or they have an agreement with the target site. And this, is, this is true whether it's an internal transfer or an external transfer. And, and what we're sharing is experience that, you know, both Chris and I were at Novartis for many, many years. Um, what we found eventually is that we not only needed a quality agreement, we needed a working agreement. The working agreement essentially meant the boots on the ground. This is the, this is the, this is the rules of engagement. This is how we're going to do it. Otherwise, you get into the situation, and it's a very real situation. You got something that goes sideways during the process. And the default is the way they do business, which is, in, our, in the case of Novartis, that's crap. We're going to do it our way or no way, because it's, we're accountable for this. As it turns out, you know, this, is, this was not the rules of engagement that we had already put in. So sending you guys into, a, into an environment like that, be it an off-site or, or a CMO or whatever, that's very, very, and it's something that's very often overlooked. So when we go in, we do a quality agreement, and then we do what's called a working agreement so that the rules of engagement are very clearly set out. What about timelines? I mean, I've seen all kinds of numbers. Uh, so what if you're going to be transferring to a CMO or whatever? What do you think? Let's talk, about, let's talk about under the environment we're talking. Big pharma and CMO, are there any differences in timing? Or? No, usually uh, the timelines uh, are given because you have uh, milestones that are a uh, you can't move, you can't make uh, six months stability is a six months stability or 12 months stability is a 12 months stability. So those are timelines. It's kind of like the joke, you know, you can't take nine, uh, nine women and put them in uh, uh, and you get a baby in one month. So uh, making a baby just takes nine months, period. But that doesn't work? <laughs> Well, there's one on me, no, man. Okay. The, the okay. timelines, uh, I would say, if you really uh, want to do it right, and uh, as I said, don't overlook the data, believe the data, have the milestones, have the, the, the checkpoints to review uh, the, the data, that you have confidence that as you go forward, you have a robust, reproducible process. So I would say anywhere between 24 and uh, 30 months for a tech transfer, uh, unless you have a real highly complex uh, process, uh, could be a aseptic, a lyophilized process, where it, it could take you longer because uh, I remember we had one process uh, where the lyophilization cycle was over 100 hours. So uh, th that was some challenges too. You know, one of the things that I, I always, you know, the timeline was one thing, it's the numbers. And the reason I say that at, um, 
you know, at Novartis, one of the things that we were famous for was combining X product with product Y, and we would always come up with uh, fixed combinations. And it was, it was a strategy. So, you know, we were looking at six tech transfers a year, and I mean, that could really drain you out. So what, now that, you know, now that you've been around in different companies, what has been your experience in that area? How many? How many? <laughs> It's really how many resources you uh, can throw uh, at it. And it, it really depends on what stage is the company. Uh, do they want to uh, transfer out some older products to free up capacity uh, at home for the newer uh, uh, high selling uh, products? So you can have eight, 10 tech transfers. Sometimes you substitute that uh, by uh, getting temporary help in, which, you know, uh, it can work. The problem is when you get temporary help in uh, consultants, uh, technicians and whatnot, uh, the problem is that once the project is complete, they leave. So the knowledge leaves. So if you bring temporary help in, make sure that you have somebody that uh, works with them very closely so that the whole uh, knowledge buildup is retained in a uh, the, the, the company that owns the product. And that's the same, you know, I think we're, our experience has been when we're gonna go to a contract, the internal transfers versus a transfer to somebody who's a partner, but not necessarily part of the, the firm. Um, I mean, I've seen a range of different things that happen. Um, you know, I think you and I, it's, I think one of the most horrific I've seen to date was, you know, we'll put together, you know, five different, five batches pre-weighed, you know, set this stuff off, put it in an air freight container, show up the next day and the guys are re the batches, mixing the batches, to, and it's like, what happened? That's so, taking stuff offshore seems to have its own, its own problems, you know, no matter how many agreements and the, you have, what have what has been Absolutely. your experience? I, I think your best bet, uh, you need a man in the plant. You, you have to have somebody on the ground uh, and just, you know, give them guidance, supervise the activities. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, you know, uh, things like weighing the drum with the lid and weighing the drum without the lid can throw you off. And uh, it can take you a couple of weeks to find out what exactly happened. And uh, <laughs> could be also a language barrier uh, sometimes where, uh, you know, to put the lid on the scale, it uh, translates in a, in a different way. <laughs> I think the, the issue being, you know, I mean, you can't, you can take nothing for granted. I mean, to the point where the example, you know, other, the example we're talking about, actually, the, we, we call it the, uh, the terrace and tapa effect yeah. in that particular case was the, uh, the lid versus no lid phenomena. Otherwise, the better known as the low assay problem. Well. And if it turns out that, you know, your procedures out in the way areas, the way with or without lids, and your numbers are off, your numbers are going to be off, I mean, mysteriously by the weight of the lid in the ring. But more importantly, I mean, and these things are not, that was, that's to the point of minutia that you don't expect is going to cause you a problem. But I mean, to the point where is, did you even read the batch record? I mean, people forget that. They talk about, you know, quality by design, knowledge transfer, and the stuff that kills you, especially if you're the guy down there running it, is the stuff that you don't tell them. So that's where the man in the plant, more importantly, the conversation between those people and yourselves have to be very detailed, okay? Otherwise, you're heading, you're heading for a disaster, right. okay? Now, and remember, they also can uh, be very creative. Uh, we had one transfer where um, at the end of packaging, there was always about 102, 103% yield. And I said, wow, how, they, how did they create mass? Uh, interesting. And uh, then we looked at uh, the analytical data and saw the, the, the essay was okay, but it was always a little bit low. Now, lo and behold, they got paid by the tablet and the bottle. So what they did to increase their yield, they ran the tablet comp the compression at the lower end to get more tablets out. And uh, 
you know, it took us a while to find that, that one out. So it's really important to have people in the plant uh, that know the process and also uh, have, uh, as you said before, the authority and the responsibility uh, to intervene when that kind of uh, uh, occurrences happen. Okay, let's, let's look at another. One of the things I always tried, I'm saying, did I sleep through something? You know, did I miss some kind of regulation or change? So, you know, I think as we had talked about, if you look over the last 20 years, the regulations, rules, and when it's speci specific to what we're talking about, has these things changed? I mean, has this become, you know, more burdensome, less burdensome, what? I don't think it, it became burdensome. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry has always uh, been a heavily regulated industry. And I think uh, if you follow uh, the rules, if you play the game by the rules, uh, you shouldn't be in trouble. Uh, the good thing is uh, a lot of companies sometimes try to cut corners, and that generates work, work for consultants. <laughs> Just kidding. I forgot about that part. Yeah, okay. All right. Ouch. So, um, so let me, let's, but you know, I think one of the things that, and this is something that we had talked to the folks a couple of times about, was uh, the concern now about the data transfers and the way and mechanisms of that these data, in other words, you're going, you, you know, it's an away game. All right. Let's remember that. Even if you're, you know, maybe you're going to be within the conf. If you're a global player, you may be going to another place. But for the most times, these are away games. So the question really comes back about other systems, data systems, data transfer, data integrity. What, what has been your experience recently with, you know, like, for example, cloud-based data? I, honestly, I haven't been really involved in that aspect. Okay. I, you know, one of the things that we were talking about, too, is in the guys here, we, were, we had them and they gave a discussion on... Um, Actual reality and virtual reality. I see this. This was uh, one of the things. That, uh, how many times have we sat there trying to make, make things work over a cellular phone? But this was, you talk about man and a plant. The trouble is you're always down to the point where it's the man and a plant. He's working on it. But if the team is sitting someplace in New Jersey and these guys sitting someplace in wherever, the communications, either he's got to turn it into, into some kind of a report, he's got to talk to you. The guys with the actual reality, there was a secure network. In fact, the way it was was that if anybody had looked at the, at the presentation, they were saying that they can hold 18 hours of solid data without even doing a transmission. So in other words, the guy goes in, he could do the triage, look, he, they see everything, can look at everything that he sees, all right, and then what he does when he comes back, assuming he has connectivity, it could be real time, or if he's in a situation where it's not a secure link, he comes out and they can, you know, then he uploads all this information to a team back home. So essentially, the team there and all the resources see that. I see that coming along pretty well. Uh, I thought that was a pretty neat way of doing it. And apparently, this is, you know, it gets back to uh, pipeline, guys building pipelines. This is a lot of the work they do, and they were using that. So I see that as a real positive. Um, so what about, you know, you talked about some cost cutting. So what about efficiencies, cost cuttings, and comp do these things complicate? These must complicate the tech transfer thing, or what are we doing? Uh, the cost cutting aspect uh, just comes into play uh, when uh, you don't get sufficient material uh, to execute uh, enough experimental batches. Uh, that's where uh, the tech transfer team runs into problems. Uh, and you really have to make a good argument, uh, again, with, with presenting the data that additional batches are required. Otherwise, you just can't defend the robustness of the process. I think. And that gets back to one of the other points we were making today, or not today, but yesterday, was the inability to institutionalize knowledge. In other words, a lot of times what we see is the tech transfer team may be an operational thing, whereas the, the process itself emanates from the development side. And it's a, you know, throw it over the wall. Believe, I was a little bit surprised to hear that that still exists in some companies. It's a continuum. 
I think anybody who's ever done this knows it's a continuum. Anybody who thinks otherwise is an idiot. Sorry, but you know, so if they, so to me, you know, the tech tra the lead up, that lead up should be almost a no brainer by the time you're at the away game. Right, you know? yeah, but I think we were ahead of uh, the times because when you were in research and development and I presented uh, technical operations, uh, we, we teamed up uh, back, as I said, in 1989 and uh, did uh, tech transfers and uh, ensured that mm -hmm. seamless uh, transfer, scale up, uh, and that uh, there was a true handshake. Yeah. And I think that, that that's really key for a good uh, technology transfer, that you have a seamless uh, transition from the 50 to the 100 to the 500 uh, to 750 kilogram uh, batch size and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and because if you don't have that and if you don't share uh, the knowledge and um, the data, then you're, you set yourself up for trouble. I think one of the things, and I, I probably talked about tech transfer to groups almost to the point where, you know, people are, you, is that what you're going to talk about again? No. <laughs> okay. But anyway, one of the things I found was this knowledge. And to be honest, because, you know, being a tech nut my, myself, I mean, I stepped back and I said, is there, is, there some, is there some piece that I'm missing? You know, invariably, you know, I've walked into facilities, we've done stuff, and it's like, well, how the hell could that have happened, you know? What I found was, you know, if you look at this whole thing as knowledge, and especially in the, in the time of, of QBD, and one of the things I've, I've, I've talked about and repeated, knowledge itself in other industries, or knowledge itself when you look at it from an academic standpoint, is broken down into three types, all right? There is explicit knowledge, which is the stuff you read, right? It's written down, it's in a notebook, it's in a manual. That's the stuff we live with, all right? There's institutional knowledge. That's the stuff that we work from. And one of the things I heard a couple of times at our panel discussions was, and I thought that by this time it doesn't exist anymore, but it does, and that is the tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is considered, it's considered sticky knowledge. You know, I think we got a rather mature audience here, so you'll all remember, I'll relate a story, so how tacit knowledge is. Real simple, right? You get a call from ops, and um, looks like our blockbuster drug just went sideways. It's capping like crazy. And, you know, okay, you got to come down and take a look at it. Well, you start looking at it. There's no rational reason as to how this happens. You know, you, you start looking at it and looking at it. And I don't know about the rest of you. Eventually, I get so desperate, I start looking to see who signed off on the batch records. And as it turns out, you know, Tom seems to be the guy who signs off. And, the last time we had a cap on this, looks like Tom was on there too. Well, you go to talk to Tom and, or, or even the reverse, you, you don't talk to, you talk to everybody else, and then you talk to Tom. It turns out, well, yeah, well, that's not really the way I run it. What do you mean it's not the way you run it? You know, in other words, this is how I set it up. This is what I put into the logic. This is how Tom puts it in. That, my friends, is this, that's the landmine that's considered tacit knowledge. How the hell did that happen? And it still happens. I mean, we sat here talking about serialization the other day. And <laughs> as I'm talking, this guy's talking all this high tech stuff and aggregation and being able to tell you who went, who tablet went in what state. The guy who's actually doing the tablet, the guy who's actually packaging this stuff said, yeah, well, as it turns out, at first we had a little bit of problem because we found that, you know, this operator really would set it up this way. And I'm like, I thought this, I thought this had ended, you know, 10 years ago. Apparently not. So thank God for that. And thank God for the consulting community. So, you know, so what do we, my recommendation is simple. Don't have to pay anybody anything. The answer is we found was the only way you do it. You, you put down and you don't want SOPs. Because then we all know what happens then. You don't update them and you don't document them. No, oh, you didn't follow the SOP. So we very deftly call it a handbook. All right. So we write a handbook. And what that is, it's a mental download. Okay. So we make sure that every product has a legacy. And that legacy resides in the handbook. 
then there's the regulated aspects and the non-regulated aspects. And it's not that you're hiding anything, it's that you've learned something. So let's get back to the launch site, target site. Um, so these working agreements, um, what has been your what has been what has been your experience when when you get in the site? Obviously, you've done a lot of offshore work. So you know, have you found that you're welcomed with open arms or what? What's yes. The deal? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No. In general, I think uh, uh, receiving site uh, appreciates um, the the support they can get and that they reach out uh, to really draw the knowledge uh, from the transferring site. And I, I think it's key that there is a good chemistry between the transferring side and the receiving side. If there are other reasons that because the material is being transferred, because the facility is being closed, and the receiving side, of course, they have an interest to get the process. On the other hand, the transferring side doesn't want to let loose. That's when you have managerial issues and you've got to address that uh, with uh, training, with uh, probably even bringing in somebody from the outside executing the process. So when we talk about a core team, I mean, most companies run things as a project team, right? That means that everybody, that represents every piece there, right? So where's the core team fit in on the project team? What would that be? Is that the tech, you know, is that, is that still a cross-functional? Is that, with, now we're talking about across the technical side, or what, what, what is the core team comp is comprised of? It? Oh, a, a core team, uh, as I said, uh, a core team should have all uh, the relevant uh, departments represented. So we are talking about uh, the analytical method transfer, so you need somebody from quality. Uh, of course, you have uh, manufacturing. Uh, for, for the process from the transfer and the receiving side. Uh, you have a, a regulatory person that uh, participates, also looking at if you want to expedite the, the transfer, make sure you don't make a lot of changes or changes that are outside the, the, the filed guidelines because that gets you in trouble uh, too. Uh, <laughs> invariantly, uh, we'll, you know, at least extend the, the stability data or the whole data package and justifications. So you have somebody from regulatory, uh, as I said, uh, a project manager is on the team, and uh, you also might want sometimes engineering when there's equipment transfers associated with it, uh, IQs, OQs, PQs to be per per performed. Uh, so. It's really uh, anything that falls under technical operations uh, when it's a site-to-site -site transfer. Uh, any department that is within a technical operations uh, should be represented. You have technical training if there is no new piece of equipment or if uh, there is also uh, uh, the training on the new process for uh, the operators. Uh, and uh, if it's a new product introduction, as we said before, of course, uh, the, uh, the development department is a part, uh, the analytical methods development uh, department is part, because that uh, then they represent the transferring site, so to speak, and the receiving site is technical operations. But I, I really don't see a big difference uh, if it's a site-to-site yeah. -site transfer or if it's a new product introduction. The elements are the same. I, you know, I get the site to site, you know, we were, you know, that's what Novartis lived on, but how about if I got to pick a site? Who go, who do we send then? The real estate guy? I mean, to me, I mean, this is where the big screw up usually happens. You know, we look at a site, so who, who goes out, looks at it and says, yeah, or what, 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 is, what does that look like? What kind of a team do you send out? Yeah, but basically, most companies these days have technical uh, services organizations that uh, really help out operations. And technical services, uh, together with a procurement, or, uh, uh, they usually go out and uh, evaluate uh, the receiving sites, especially when it's a contractor. Uh, you go look at uh, the sites, what are the capabilities, uh, how good is the match to your current process, uh, what is their e equipment uh, that uh, you might consider for your process? Uh, how well is it a match? How many uh, process changes we might have to do? 
or is it a like-for-like, -like, straightforward um, transfer? And uh, also then comes the financial aspect, uh, where you look at uh, how, how much do they charge you uh, per tablet? Yeah. And, you know, uh, quite a few companies engage in a, a kind of a Kepner Traeger uh, evaluation model where uh, you look at four or five different uh, contractors that uh, potentially could do your process and you do the must haves and nice to haves uh, and you list that up and you get a score. And it really helps, although it's not the end all. You have to look at the history. Uh, of their GMP compliance. Uh, did they have uh, FDA uh, visits? Uh, are they FDA compliant? Are they uh, EMEA compliant? Especially when you have a product that is sold globally. I mean, you might look at the Japanese. Did they uh, uh, have a visit from the, from the Japanese and also from uh, Brazil? Uh, so uh, those are uh, the regulatory aspects that are very important because you can transfer it and then later on you realize they are at the brink of a warning letter. Uh, it's probably not the right company to go to. You know, one of the things I've found too, Chris, was, uh, and I think you and I have shared the pain on this a couple of times, is invariably the thing that really comes back and bites you. You know, we, we, sure, we drill into the regulatory, we drill into the... It's what about the infrastructure? Who's looking at the infrastructure? That is, you know, yeah, I mean, right down to what zip code are we in, right? So the answer is, you know, who looks at that? Is that somebody in engineering or what, what do we do? Well, I think it's uh, probably the, the technical services organization uh, with uh, procurement goes for a first visit. Uh, I had the case where uh, we visited uh, a potential CMO and we walked into that and we said, whoa, that's about 40 years old. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, you look at these pieces of equipment and say, you ask, uh, when did you service uh, that fluid bed dryer the last time? And uh, so if you have some doubts about that, you definitely bring uh, your engineering department with you for a second visit uh, to look at uh, the maintenance records. Uh, how old is the equipment, has it been serviced, uh, were there uh, significant, uh, um, let's say, problems with the piece of equipment. Uh, also, uh, when you talk infrastructure, uh, how is the water system, what kind of a water system is there, how is it being sanitized, how is it being maintained, if you need any uh, other kind of uh, gases, nitrogen or uh, other uh, gas distribution systems, you look at that. Uh, you might also look at the, the overall facility HVAC uh, set up, uh, HEPA filters. Do they really service the HEPA filters? So uh, there is a whole checklist uh, that you can go through and uh, just make you feel comfortable that the company really knows how to run the facility. And believe it or not, you can find certain things where you say, hmm, really? Yeah, I mean... Having said all of that, I think one of the, well, I, I, I haven't categorized them into biggest disaster, smallest disaster, but anyway, you know, you walk into a room, literally, you got to make sure the light's light, right? And we just heard, you got to make sure where the water's coming from. And I have to tell you, we're, we, you know, obviously we've been around the block a few times, all of us. In many countries is the water, right? Not only that, is the water going to be coming on a regular basis? But let me, let me explain one other thing. So we thought we had pretty much airtight. So we went back, you know, you do it. And what I recommend is you do a, you do a bar, your barometer check, right? You go in, we're humming along, right? You go back in two months to see, you know, I, you know we should be at stasis, right? And everything looks good. The analytical data is coming. In fact, these guys are doing a better job than we did, right? But, so you go down and, you know, it's all about throughput, right? Because it's going to be a lead up to continuous, but it doesn't, right now it's a specific story. So we go down and um, we walk in and um, notice, first thing that strikes me is that in one process, they were moving all of the wash water with a vacuum. Interesting, considering we spent a lot of money 
putting in clean in place in the systems and all. Remember, we went in and literally redid the infrastructure for this very reason. Odd, right? I mean, why would you spend the money, right? And they're taking the water out in a vacuum. As we walk into the room, and I'll never forget this, and I relate this to everybody, because it's, it's something you don't think about. As I walk into the room, and I hadn't noticed it until I, I was standing there, I'm looking and thought maybe that there was a pro I noticed that floor drains were also sealed up. I'm thinking to myself, this can't be good. So we get down in this, so we start to, you know, we start to talk. You know, to me, I start with the guy who's got his hands in the water, right? So I said, what is going on here? Well, he said, well, we can't put the water in the sewer anymore. So you got a water treatment plant. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not going to get that answer from him. So you go back. As it turns out, the water treatment plant we put in, on top of their water treatment plant, did not account for the solids that we were in our effluent. In fact, it's not only the concentration of the solids, it's what the solids were. Now, where the hell were you when I told you the formulation? All right? Everybody sat in a room. We all looked at this. We all knew what the formula was. We all knew what the pigments were. And now you're telling me you can't put it, you can't put it out there? Now, a lot of engineers out there. I'm just a poor little you know, tablet maker. Right? I don't have to tell you what a, re a restructure on a water treatment facility is going to cost you. That's as, bad, that's as good as me introducing a process that doesn't run. And how the hell did that happen? We, you know, and honestly, you know, we're, 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 that's why we led up to this, why we held your question. We've done all of this stuff, and there it is. Taped up drains, drum, oh, best, best yet, the drums had to be shipped out. And we're talking about water, right? And we're shipping water like it was a drug. I mean, I mean are we for real or what? So needless to say, beyond my complete amazement, and as you can tell, I'm a pretty quiet guy, so needless to say, it didn't really go down well with me. And I made sure that everybody shared my discomfort, you know? But I'm like, how the hell could this happen? Yeah, you know, how could a tech trans, let's just, let's be realistic. So, you know, Johnson & Johnson or Janssen sends a team down. Are you going to make sure that you have, a, you, you, you got a guy who knows about effluent and sewage? I mean, that should have been done up front. Somebody should have figured that one out, right? Here we are two years later and we're drumming the water because we can't use the water treatment plant. I can tell you now that when I go to facilities like that, the first thing on my agenda is I want to go out and see the water treatment plant because I know somebody's going to screw me on that one. So we got a few more minutes. Uh, again, the basis of this was we could talk tech transfer. I could tell you how to write protocols. That's all crap. What I found was the most important thing about tech transfer is talk to the guys that wear the scars and figure out, you know, what was the most recent thing that you stepped on and it blew up? Tech transfer, I mean, there's nothing magic to tech transfer. But what I'm amazed, uh, especially we are now in the 21st century, and a... Uh, you know, tech transfer has been around. There are companies that teach tech transfer. They, they, they teach you how to set up. But what I experienced in the last, uh, let's say, six to nine months, how pharmaceutical companies still in the 21st century operate, I, I just shake my head. I mean, people, it's really simple. Talk to each other, share the information, raise issues early, and really just interact, keep an open mind, because if you don't do that, I mean, the, the, the company that says, oh, you can't talk to uh, the CMO, uh, only corporate talks to them, and we will let you know what they tell us, that, that, that is just unbelievable. I mean, that, that, and it happened 10 days ago mm -hmm. in Europe. I mean, I, I, it's amazing. I just, it's just amazing. Right. Because setting up, it's not rocket science. <laughs> it's really getting a core team that knows what they're doing. You pick the qualified people. And as I said before, 
don't make it a 40, 50 people team, make it a uh, 8 to 12 people based on consulting firms. It shouldn't be more than a 8 to 12 people that really strategically run the project. And then you have the sub teams that are executing the tactical aspect of, of the project and you will succeed as long as you talk to each other. Yep, and be aware of, there's another very, there's anybody who's in late stage, okay? If, if you're in late stage and this is where you're at, this is where I always call the rubber meets the road. When the guys in early, the early stage, they tell you how they've done this and they've demonstrated from the scale to scale and you hear them invoke words such as when they're looking at kinetic data, we're talking blood data, we're talking the big money now, right? And you hear them utter the words that it was not clinically significant. Every red light in your head's got to go off. What that means is they just threw it over the wall. Remember, they worked in plus or minus 30%. And you work in the world of plus or minus five. And you're heading for one. Yeah? And the whole world thinks we're, you know, we're, uh, we're heading to you know, perfection. When I hear that word, and the guy said, well, you know, you know if, that we're looking at the blood data, and it's like, yep, not clinically significant, which that means is, well, the guy probably won't die, or he won't have, he, he will have some sort of a good effect. Okay, but that's not what I'm, I, you know, we had the guy here in biosimilars. If you're in tech transfer, you're in, you know, you got a goal post. Nobody's going to say, yeah, as long as you get it to the end zone. They're saying not only you got to get it to the end zone, you got to kick it from the 70-yard line and you got to get it through the goalpost. Oh, and by the way, that goalpost is now 10 yards shorter. That's the key. I can't emphasize that enough when I talk. And again, this is, this is true internally when I worked 30 years at Novartis. And this is true to this day when, I, when, I, as I, when we consult. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Pharmaceutical Processing, in conjunction with Interfex 2016, presents Interfex Live.